Hey, 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 Fit Mama, Jen Oliver here, your host of the Fit Mama podcast. This is the work in to your workout. Hey, 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 and welcome, Fit Mama, to today's episode. You are in for a good time today. I am interviewing Krista Ardeline. Krista is a birth sibling and postpartum doula and a childbirth educator. She has served women during all stages of their parenthood journeys with educational classes, one-on-one support, in-home or hospital birth support, and postpartum care. Her mission is to change the narrative around the process in which we all enter the world and create an environment where women are educated and encouraged to make the decisions that they know are best for their families. When she is not at a birth, you can find her curled up with a classic novel, drinking any form of coffee or practicing music. You will love my conversation today with Krista. We talk all about what a doula is. She gives so many incredibly great tips, tools, ideas, and a lot of mindset shifts. She has such a beautiful perspective on birth. And it's very exciting because Krista is actually in the process of having her baby right now. She announced on the podcast that she was pregnant and she is now at the point where she is giving birth any day now. So it's super duper exciting. Without further ado, let's talk to Krista. Here she is. Here we are with the one and only Krista, the doula. Hey, Krista. Hi, Jen. Thanks so much for having me today. Oh, my gosh. It is so fun having you here because, you know, I didn't know what a doula was until I was pregnant. And the first time I met my doula, I bawled my head off in a restaurant because I was like, I have to birth out this baby that keeps on growing. And I freaked myself out. I literally was like clenched, like, uh, you know, the tightest thing ever. And I was just freaking out. And then once I really had a better understanding of a few, honestly, it was like some key definitions that she went through with me. And all of a sudden I felt like I had a new insight. Do you see how that is? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's always amazing. Um, we are human beings, not human beings. Mm. <laughs> and what your doula does is not go along with a magic pill or a magic philosophy or, you know, a bunch of hip squeezes, mm. um, but she teaches you to recognize what's going on in your own body and take back that power. We live in this culture that says, you know, you're super strong, you're super tough, you're an amazing woman who can do anything, except for maybe childbirth. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, you can do hard things. You're amazing at hard things, but but childbirth has kind of been painted as like the pinnacle of mm. hard things. And so what I tell my clients is, you know, you're an amazing woman. You're a strong woman. You've been through maybe marriage, relationships. You've been through school. You've done all of these things that are hard. You can do childbirth. Mm. <laughs> you can do it. You have it in you. So, so it's a lot of mm. um, helping women to recognize what's already within them. And I'm sure we'll get into that. Well, I love that. And I do want to dive right in, as I always do, which is, what is a doula, Krista? Absolutely. So a doula, or a birth doula, I should specify, is your non-medical support for childbirth. So you get your care provider, you get your husband, you get your mom, maybe you have some other professionals around you or doctors around you. And your doula is that in-between that provides you with information and support and helps you to, as you said, break down those definitions, that medical jargon, actually understand what's going on in your body and around you and make choices that you have to make. So people really underestimate the amount of decisions you have to make really from end of life in pregnancy, whether it's what testing you want to do, whether it's um, what procedures or interventions that you want to go through. And then of course, during childbirth, there's a whole slew of decisions that you have to make. So I work with families prenatally to help them build what we call a birth plan to understand their options, to have a realistic expectation of how birth is going to go. And I always find it so funny when I sit down with a client and they talk to me, okay, I just did my uh, you know 20 week appointment and they told me this and this and that. And I say to them, how do you feel about that? And they kind of stare at me blankly because nobody has ever asked them how they feel about that. And they didn't know wow. that there were options. So I work with them to create a birth plan 
of options and to understand how they can make choices and be empowered going through the birth. And then of course, when they go into labor, I actually walk with them through the entire process. Uh, no matter if it's a belly birth or a vaginal birth or however they decide to do that. Wow. So you're there at the birth, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, postpartum, I can connect them with other resources as well. There are different kinds of doulas. There are postpartum doulas. There are adoption doulas. There are even bereavement doulas now. Because I think we're really realizing this culture that there's a huge gap between mm -hmm. our innate natural wisdom, what we know our bodies can do, and medical jargon and medical testing. We know that there's there's a gap within there. Uh, so doulas are really helping to bring men back to their power, to help them make decisions that make them feel strong and make them feel confident. Yeah, that sounds like a breath of fresh air and something that really never needed to go away in the birth process. Um, but maybe that makes sense, right? Things became medicalized and, and the medical system is so great for so many things, particularly prevention of a lot of life-threatening things. Absolutely. However, you know, words like epidural or episiotomy were words to me that were part of the birth jargon that I didn't need to know until I was in the birth and then I needed to use that intervention if God forbid that was the thing. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, the medical system gets demonized a lot, especially in the birth world, the natural birth world. And really, I'd say they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Your baby's right. safe because they're focusing on their task, which is keeping you safe. A lot. Keeping your baby safe and providing you with what you need. My job is to provide you the information because at the end of the day, they can do whatever you need them to do, but you're the one who gets to make that decision yeah and one person really can't do it all right or even no. one medical field and i think like you said you have your best friend you have your husband partner whatever you have your mother maybe not maybe whoever mm -hmm. and you then i know in the system that i had babies in you could choose a midwife or yeah. uh an ob gyn right an actual yeah. medical doctor but a medical doctor that was a surgeon, right? So how do you educate people? Do they come to you as soon as to go like, do I want a doctor or midwife? Because everybody that I knew and still work with either goes with someone that their mother or friend knew yeah. or what so-and-so did or what they know. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm going to actually answer that with a story. Um, I grew up, I'm actually the oldest of seven children. Ooh. My mother had seven unmedicated births. Wow really strong, powerful woman. My mom is one of my best friends and my biggest sources of inspiration. Uh, growing up, my siblings and I did not see birth as something to be feared. Mm. Honest to goodness, uh, one of my most poignant memories, I think is so funny, is I remember making lasagna with my mom while she was in labor. <laughs> mm. We would lay her down the noodles so that she could lean over. We'd kind of breeze with her. I'd rub her back and then she'd keep going. So I grew up Come on, I have goosebumps. That's really so cute. That's so cute. Childbirth and yeah. pregnancy, and you know, uh, women's health. I thought that it was amazing. I was so excited mm. for my body to mature and my body to get to experience these sacred rites of passage. So, fast forward to when I was a teenager, I was living down the road from a woman who was a doula, and she started asking if I could babysit while she went to birth. And of course, while I was there, I'm looking at her bookshelf and I start pulling off these books just out of interest. All the greats, Ian McGaskin, Penny mm. Simpson. And greatly the Greek, these incredible people, uh, these incredible sources of wisdom. And what I noticed is in every resource, they talked about this fear culture. A lot of it was to combat the fear. And I thought, people are afraid of birth. Mm. I didn't know that. You were shocked. So I started getting into doula work, and I noticed that people didn't want to talk about it. I would bring up childbirth, and they're like, why is a 17-year-old talking about childbirth? It was such a taboo subject, and so I began exploring the reasons why, and I found that a lot of it came down to people simply not knowing, not mm -hmm. knowing what their bodies were capable of, for people not 
knowing what to expect. Yeah. And that created a lot of fear. So a lot of women don't know that you can choose a midwife. And as you said, they just go with whatever their mom or their best friend did or, um, you know, the opposite of that is true too. I just go with, you know, a midwife, I guess I'll have an unmedicated birth because my mom had that and my grandma had that and mm. I guess it's good enough for me. And we forget that we were created with so much wisdom and strength to make our own decisions. My mom had seven very different births, but what was impressed upon me when I grew up was that she always believed that she had the strength for whatever birth was going to throw her. So I would say, you know, we didn't grow up grow up fooled. It wasn't that we grew up thinking that there was no way that there could ever be a complication, but she really showed that she believed she had the strength and of course we'll get into this, but the support system to deal with whatever it threw her because she believed that she was strong enough. And that to me is so powerful. So that's really um, what I try to bring back. I've had clients contact me at all stages of their pregnancy. Sometimes it's early in their pregnancy, or maybe their friends had doulas, and they're just, they're so impressed by the reviews that they want to come and they want to get that kind of support. Mm. Maybe um, it's later in their pregnancy, and they really have found they had to have a lot of support, and they're just really desperate to have somebody sit and listen to them and, and advocate for them to make decisions that are right for themselves. So they come to me in, in all different um, stages of their pregnancy and their childbirth journey and I just say I'm here to support you no matter what um same with as we're talking about you know different types of birth there can be a lot of stigma around a woman who comes and says I don't want to push my baby out mm -hmm. I don't feel like I can handle that there's a lot of stigma around a woman that says um that pain is going to leave me with trauma. I want to get an epidural. There can be stigma around the woman who says, I really don't want a medication. I really don't want to go to the hospital. And so really what I'm doing is creating that objective, safe space. I'm not your partner. I'm not your mom or your best friend. I don't carry my own baggage along with that. I've seen so many women give birth so many different ways. And I know that when you lean into your intuition and you do things the way you know to be best, I know you're going to be okay. I know that you're going to come out of it powerfully. Um, and, and so it's really that objective, you know, third party support. Wow. And how incredible to have that someone to answer questions, someone to advocate for you, you know, sometimes we we don't advocate for ourselves and we, we go into situations like birth where we really almost like can't advocate for ourselves because of the situation we're in. How do you, yeah. yeah, how do you work with families, clients, patients, et cetera? Tell us about what you do with them. Oh yeah, I'd love to run, run that down, absolutely. So uh, I do spend time with them prenatally and our time prenatally, I usually see them in kind of the earlier stages of their pregnancy and then again before they go into labor mm -hmm. um, and what I'm doing is really taking in all of the information that's coming in around them from their care provider from the books they're reading from the podcasts they're absorbing and I'm helping them to break it down to listen to their intuition and do what's right for them so um, again right a big focus of childbirth is pain control mm -hmm. um we tend to be have a lot of fear around contractions in our culture so what i help women to do is break down the fear surrounding that by giving them an open ear a safe space to talk freely and then helping to remind them of the truths of their body so i tell my clients Take those things that are running around in your head. You know, if you're pregnant, you've got fears running through your head. Uh, write them down and replace them with something you know to be true about your body. And then when we start from a place of empowerment, I walk them through what to expect from a birth. I always say familiarity lessens fear. Mm -hmm. So I talk to them about what they might be up against. So when we talk about what contractions might feel like, we talk about the different feelings and stages of labor and how it can ebb and flow and progress. We talk about comfort measures because whether you use pain medication or not, everyone deserves to be comfortable in their labor. Mm -hmm. And I really push this idea of pain versus suffering. So pain is an unpleasant physical sensation. Suffering is a feeling of helplessness. And I know um, mm -hmm. that you know a lot about this with um, working in 
exercise and mm. fitness. Mm. You know, exercise can have pain associated with it, but it's very different than the kind of pain that you have if you touch a hot stove or if you go for surgery, right? Mm. It's a positive pain. It's your body saying, this is really hard, but this is really good. And childbirth is very similar to that. So we reframe our idea around pain mm. and we remember that the pain that comes with childbirth is pain and should not be akin to suffering. And so we start from that empowered mindset and we move through all of the different options and all of the different expectations from childbirth. And that's everywhere from um, everywhere from getting an epidural or not to um, what kind of interventions we might need to introduce if you know your cervix wasn't progressing, what kind of um, options are going to be thrown at you in the hospital as far as where you want to birth, how many people are going to be in the room, everything affects it. So uh, another thing I, another really key um, concept we go over is your hormone flow. So in order for your body to open up and your baby to join you in the world effortlessly, your body needs to produce a nice strong flow of oxytocin. And oxytocin is known in the medical world as actually the love hormone mm -hmm. because it's the same hormone that is present when you have sex, when you feel comforted, when you feel loved. Basically, anytime your body's able to relax and open up. And your body will not produce that hormone unless you're in that state of comfort. So we tend to get really obsessed with medications, but that's only one key piece. Comfort measures are really important to focus on. So I do go over medications, but we also practice a lot of comfort measures. And of course, as you can probably guess, those are so unique to every person mm -hmm. because every mom is different. So I spend a lot of time, that's where the listening comes in, getting to know my mm -hmm. clients, who they are, and the different things that are going to affect them. So that's one of the reasons I actually meet with women in their homes prenatally. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have an office. I like to go to their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, one, because it's just a more private space and people, if we're going to be talking about their cervix and their vagina, they prefer to be in their living rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, but also because it gives me an insight into who they are. You know, mm -hmm. are they very tidy? Are they very organized? Are, you know, are they very collective? What is their mood? What is their personality like? Because little things like that are going to make a big difference in whether their oxytocin can flow. Uh, so we spend a lot of time getting to know how that is going to be easily released for clients. Um, and as I mentioned, there's so many variables around that. You might have a client who is a survivor of sexual abuse. And that means that we're going to spend a lot more time talking about cervical checks and privacy and how we can make that more comfortable for them. Um, I might have a client who is maybe um, single and doesn't feel like they have that warm, loving support of a partner. And that is going to play into it. Um, I might have a client who is maybe has an autoimmune disease and is very sensitive to different stimuli, whether it's like noise, smells, sounds, um, all of those things are going to come into play when we're talking about that good oxytocin flow that helps us feel comfortable and empowered and loved. And of course, ultimately helps our baby to actually move down with ease and health and vitality. And so we really focus on uh, knowing who we are and how we can really tune into who we are um, to help our body ultimately give birth. That is gorgeous. I love the way you describe that. That's so great. And I think the key words that stood out for me there was opening up. And mm -hmm. it's a lot of the stuff that I talk about with women specifically. And funny that you said the love hormone around orgasm and it's yeah. that letting go, relaxing, and opening up that enables them to receive that pleasure of yes. an orgasm, which, yes. you know, some people go into after they've had kids before they've had an orgasm. So there you yeah. go. And there's that, right? So people are all over in terms of what they've experienced, as you said. And I think the bottom line is there is a safety requirement that each Absolutely. woman has and, and her getting into that state of comfort such that she can open up. That's beautiful. And that you identify that and then now are doing practical things that will yes. help her. That's incredible. It, women are always amazed at how 
practical those little things are. So what I try to do is take the five cents approach mm. uh, with them. So we go through different stages of labor and I look at how are your five senses going to react to the different things that are inevitably going to come up, right? We talk about noise. So I've seen births transformed by adding a different noise stimuli into the room. You know, if mom is really being bothered by that beeping machine, introducing some kind of soft music, um, what we see, right? really, really affects it. So something as simple as writing an affirmation down. So we can sit there all day and chant to ourselves, I am powerful, I am strong. But for some women, what they see, that's powerful to them, writing it down, taping it above the wall in our bed, um, turning the lights off so we don't have distractions around us so our body can more easily produce those hormones, things that we smell. Birth comes with so many different scents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so being able to control the scents of the room, I know for some women that's essential oils, for some women it's having their own hospital gown, something they've either bought online or they're wearing something that they brought from home and it's comfortable to them. That makes them feel empowered. You know, what they're tasting, um, all of these different things, the way they feel. Um, for some women, informed consent is more important than anything else. They need people to ask before they touch. Um, and that can really be powerful when we lay that out in a written birth plan as well. Uh, and that's why we take the five cents approach and then we put it down on paper as well. So everybody, whether it's your care provider, you know, a nurse who walks into the room, whether it's, you know, your mother-in-law who wants to come along is on the same page and we're all there serving you. Yes, that sounds really nice. And I mean, it comes back to relieving that level of fear, as you mentioned, because Mm -hmm. it's so common to fear the pain. And that surely does not let the love hormone flow. Oh, no. So they say, um, we say empowerment and oxytocin is the gas pedal and adrenaline, which is that fear, is Mm -hmm. the brakes Mm -hmm. of labor. (laughs) Adrenaline. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we like to stay in that, I think, I believe you can correct me on this, it's the parasympathetic mode. Yes. We like to stay in that nice, calm space, and that can be achieved with the smallest things. And honestly, that can be achieved by having a doula present. Mm-hmm. I truly believe that. So I remember my very first birth quite a few years ago now. Um, I had my full birth bag packed up with all these tricks and tips. I was so excited, mm-hmm. and I met her at the hospital, and the birth was very, very quick, and I didn't get to pull anything out of my bag. And I remember thinking, I failed. Oh. Like, <laughs> I didn't do anything for her. I let her down. Mm. Uh, and I remember meeting with her in the postpartum stage, and she said, oh, having you there was amazing. She said people would come in, they would frown at the monitor, they would shake their head and walk away. My husband looked like he was going to have a panic attack. She said, but I looked over at you, and you just looked like you believed in me. She said, I looked over and I knew that you looked calm and you, you had every confidence in me. And then I had every confidence in me. And that taught me so much about the true nature of what we do. Yeah. Because your nurturing shines through in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And knowing that she has that extra support. I mean, I had a doula for both of mine and Mm -hmm. I, it's funny that you say that about yours. I, um, yeah, I basically didn't really need mine and I, it was so quick and everything happened so fast. And, you know, it was almost like, oh, I was looking forward to like what they talk about music or a massage or this or that. And I'm yeah. like, none of that happened. It was like, baby wanted to come and there she was. Right. Uh, yeah. And so Absolutely. I, but I cannot tell you after I had one and it was quick and I, and I knew it was, you know, it's not something I needed. I chose to have a doula again the second time around. Mm-hmm. And, well, and yeah. I tell you know, I'm going to say, I could not do it without you. I said, Aww. oh, yes, you could. Aww. Oh, yes, you could. Um, I'm not bringing in any kind of magic wand or special <laughs> touch, right? Um, am I trained in that special massage? Oh, yes. Will that take the pressure off your contractions? Oh, you bet. And I will do that all day until my knees bleed on the tile floor for you. <laughs> um, but you know, the magic is not in what I bring in my bag, right? Or my Mm -hmm. hands, or even an empathetic heart, right? Mm -hmm. The magic is in you knowing you're supported. Mm -hmm. Um, And I tell my clients, you know, we can work on this birth plan. We've been working on this birth plan for eight months. And if we get into the labor room and you turn around and you say, Chris, I'm going for a C-section, I'm going to say, all right, sister. (laughs) And that doesn't mean I'm not going to give you the 
information, yeah. right? Um, there are certainly risks with different decisions, and I'm there to help you have the information that you need to be confident about decisions. But, you know, as I said, if, if you're pushing the baby out and you turn around and say, Krista, I need some space, I will be sitting outside the door. Yeah. Um, you're supported no matter what decision mm-hmm. you choose to make. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that. you know, that is invaluable. And that's one of the things when people are pregnant, they consider when it t- comes to value and cost of things. It's like... Are you covered by the medical system? Oh, you're not? That's an out-of-pocket price. And I remember having this conversation with my husband when he didn't understand what a doula was. And truly and honestly, I don't know that I really understood what a doula was. But from everything that I had read, I'm like, I want one. And I'm not having a baby without one. And this is how it goes. But I do remember a time where I was needing to, quote-unquote, convince him that this was a valuable thing. And I think there's really just no price you can put on having a doula oh, i would agree i actually had clients that uh, brought me to tears this summer they mm. um, gave up buying a new car to mm. hire a doula oh. because they were newly pregnant and to them you know they recognized the transformative power of labor mm. they recognized that this was such a big moment in their life and they made sacrifices i just thought um, that was amazing. I would say partners typically have some of the hardest time with it, and that is so understandable yeah. because I know that for a partner, sometimes they think, I want to be your support. Yeah. Um, and what I, you know, my mission is to say, listen, a doula does not replace you because a doula cannot replace you. No. I say, a doula knows birth, your partner knows you. Mm-hmm. I can sit in your living room and talk with you all day, but I won't know you like your partner does mm-hmm. and I can't love you like yeah. they can and that is just as invaluable as anything I bring yeah. um, I thought it was amazing I had a dad say uh, this summer as well he said um, you call any dad and I will convince them wow. so having you there meant I didn't need to worry about all the little details in our birth plan you know I didn't yeah. need to go and turn off a light every time someone flipped it on I didn't need to remember to bring things you know, I didn't need to have 15 different positions in my head to suggest to her when she got tired. She said, I could hold her. I could be there. I could just do my job mm. and be a partner and not worry. And I really think that is the power of a doula for partners is it really takes so much pressure off of their shoulders. Hey, Fit Mama, I want to interrupt this episode just for a quick reminder to check out the love Fit Mama way. If you haven't already checked out the book online, it's available on Amazon. The link is in the show notes. It is a very comprehensive book for you where I explain how the transition into motherhood is a window of opportunity to transform the core of your being as a human and a leader. I go into detail about what you can do physically to rehabilitate your deep inner core after pregnancy and childbirth. It doesn't matter how many years postpartum. I emphasize that being a fit mama all starts with love and what goes into the embrace, nurture, and enjoy framework as I outline this journey for you. Because it's all about transforming from the inside out, focusing within, not without. Cultivating those healthy habits that stick, that are for you, is what this new generation of fit mamas like you really want. I lay out and I dive into the Fit Mama Foundations along with all the relevant tools, new ideas, recommendations, scientific backup, and intriguing perspectives that will leave you feeling empowered fit mama and determined to connect deeper with your own core. Regardless if you're male or female, with or without kids of your own, you will find this book thought-provoking and practical in moving you toward true love and reverence towards your body and your life. I guarantee it, Fit Mama. Reach out. Please let me know how you like the book. It's only $4.69 on Kindle, and you have a Kindle app for free on your phone. If you don't, grab a Kindle. They're awesome. You can read it right on your computer, though. And the paperback is only $24.95. I honestly know that it's worth it. It is over 10 years of research and 
pretty much 20 years of experience plus my whole life, but it is a wealth of knowledge. And I know this makes a really, really great gift for any of those pregnant or new fit mamas out there. I guarantee you're going to feel a breath of fresh air from reading this book and sharing it with your friends and family is giving love right to them. I talk all about healing your seal and doing the pearl pull-ups to bring yourself back into a place of equilibrium in your core, a nice connection, connecting with your deep inner core, how to rehab, what it all means. And it's super, super clear and simple. So check out the book, get it on Amazon. The link is in the show notes. And back to the episode. Have a great day, Fit Mama. Oh, yeah. And I just got goosebumps for, I think, the 10th time in this interview. Uh, Krista, yeah, like seriously. Oh, my gosh, it's too much. But it's honestly so true. And it sounds it sounds almost, you know, expected in this interview while I'm talking to you about doula. And I had two for my very own who now my kids are six and eight. And I've been talking about this for years, but I'm always recommending it because I think we don't even know sometimes our own strength until it is reflected back to us. Oh yeah. And we never considered it. They say, what's one thing I should know about childbirth? And I say, it's transformative. Mm. However it goes, you will not walk out the same person. And how you Mm. feel walking away from your birth has the power to change how you feel about yourself as a woman, how you feel about yourself as a mother, as a community helper, Mm -hmm. as a partner. And by the way, that has zero things to do with the type of birth that you choose. Yeah. And that is not to minimize anybody who goes through birth trauma. It's a real thing. Oh, yeah. But it is not dependent on what you choose. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times we, we really equate it with that. Well, if I, if I hadn't gotten an epidural, well, if I hadn't had a C-section, um, or, you know, if I had just been strong enough, quote unquote, mm-hmm. to have a natural birth, but how you feel coming out of it really has to do with whether you were empowered to make the choices that were best for you, whether you were supported in that, um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I can't say it enough. <laughs> absolutely. You know, and this is really why I do, and I talk about this in the book, The Love Fit Mama Way, which the subtitle of that book is Transforming the Core of Motherhood. And yes. what we're talking about today, I, you know, I talk about the core, as you know, and, you know, everybody hears me talking about the pelvic floor and all the things, but really it's about the transformation of us mothers as women into a different level. It's a mm-hmm. leadership opportunity like no other to be a mother, right? And oh, yes. it's so empowering. And I think we do become disempowered when things don't go as planned and things don't go as we wanted or our friend told us a C-section was bad and we really didn't want one. Mm-hmm. And then we ended up getting one and now we feel shame or uh, whatever. You know, I talk about it right out is like you said earlier, writing it out. Mm -hmm. having it written down in a journal, whether it's your plan, writing it out in advance and then going and sort of actually combing through it, maybe even with your doula after your birth and saying, you know, I really wanted this to happen and that never happened. And now, and this happened and now I'm pissed. I have friends and clients who have been pissed for years. That's no word of a lie because they still felt like I should have done something different. Oh, yes. I had a client who was planning um, an unmedicated vaginal birth uh, recently, ended up with a cesarean, a Mm -hmm. few different interventions. Um, And as she was speaking to me at our postpartum visit, I always visit postpartum to make sure that uh, they do have time. Women do have time to process what they went through. Um, to ask questions because as you know being through it yourself sometimes when you're in that labor land uh, you don't always know what's going on around you so they have that opportunity to ask questions to kind of understand what totally went on during their birth have it put in some sort of a timeline Mm -hmm. Um, and my client's telling me about this and and what I kept hearing her say was but it's okay but it's okay but it's okay Mm -hmm. Uh, and what I said to her is you are allowed to mourn your birth Mm-hmm. You are allowed to be sad that it did not go the way you planned, you planned, mm-hmm. and the way you wanted. Um, you had a beautiful plan, uh, and it is okay to be sad. It doesn't mean you don't love your baby. I think as moms, we're so scared that somebody is going to jump up, and rightfully so because culture has been tough with that. Yeah. Uh, but 
his moms were so scared that somebody's going to jump up and say, oh, well, you don't even love your child or you're not grateful, right? That's the big one. You're not grateful. And being sad that something didn't happen a certain way is not not being grateful. Mm -hmm. Those are very, very different things. So as much as that space in the birth room is important, that space afterward is very important too, to be able to process and and share and uh, yeah, be, be loved and supported. Mm -hmm. And I think a large part of it, as I'm sure you talk through during all parts of the, the work you do, is really about that dropping of self-judgment. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, uh, more than ever, right, people are in comparing mode. And it's not it's not hard to do because we're inundated, right, with the way that is to quote unquote right. Oh, absolutely. And it's um, that can be really tough, especially if you come from a certain culture where you're mm. expected to birth a certain way or, you know, all of my friends on Instagram. <laughs> I actually mm -hmm. had a friend who hid her IV port in that kind of birth announcement picture because she didn't want people to see that she'd had an intervention, mm -hmm. um, which breaks my heart mm -hmm. it breaks my heart because those kind of feelings as i mentioned birth is transformative those kind of feelings are going to follow you into motherhood mm -hmm. um you know if you spend those first five minutes of your baby's life feeling like you don't have what it takes mm -hmm. you're not gonna all of a sudden feel like a rock star five weeks in right mm -hmm. uh, and so really starting with that power of affirmation starting with making decisions confidently with all of the information you have is so important and so powerful and it doesn't just change mothers lives it changes uh communities mm -hmm. wow it changed my life to have my mother raise me that way and give me uh that strength and i certainly would not be what i'm doing today uh if it wasn't for her my husband and i are expecting our first little one oh, in july congratulations <laughs> thank you i'm so excited for you thank you so much i'm already um I'm already experiencing, you know, the stories people tell you and all of the information coming at you. And I'm so mm -hmm. thankful that I started with this basis of empowerment, that I have a support team that tells me, you can do it. You've got everything you need to do this. Um, and it's, it's really invaluable. And it's why I do what I do every day. It's why I could, like, I truly could not do anything else. And yeah, you were made to be a doula. Me. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly. Uh, and even some of the pictures that you share on your Instagram uh, are graphic. <laughs> and I am, I, I personally have like a bit of a blood aversion. And oh, really? I, when, <laughs> sometimes when I see like pictures that have any blood, let's say, even around Halloween, yeah. the makeup, I was like, oh, yeah. like, it's intense. Yeah. It really triggers something in me. So that totally. was a lot of my fear going into the birthing process was... Oh, yeah what am I going to do? Right. How am I going to handle it all? And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, I really do believe that, uh, I think it's having those conversations and I think we assume too, too much that it's so oh, yes. normal to have babies that our doctor is going to know and tell us if we need to know anything. So we'll just show up to oh, our yeah. appointments. We'll just do the thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it was so I actually had this conversation with a client who gave birth a couple weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. We were talking about pushing in one of our prenatals, and I said, when you reach 10 centimeters, uh, there's going to be a point where either your body's going to take over, begin to push for you, or for a lot of women, what happens is the contractions actually space out quite a bit, mm -hmm. and then you have two options, whether you want to sit with that resting and wait until your body takes over, or whether you want to start pushing uh, with coaching so the nurses will come in and they'll coach you to start pushing your baby down uh, and then you'll get to make that decision and I remember my client saying you know that is something I never would have thought of and knowing that that's going to come mm -hmm. knowing that that decision is going to happen makes such a difference for me because when that happened it wasn't that you know she had made up her mind and she knew every detail of exactly what she was going to do but being prepared takes the fear away and makes us able to listen to our instincts mm. in the moment, right? Because we're connected with that parasympathetic place because there's not fear or unknown butting its way in. No. And that adrenaline will take us outside of our body, won't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's yeah. amazing to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a uh, disconnection. A yeah, I see a lot of that with a lot of women. 
and especially choose uh, visualization. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they really feel like they almost left their body during mm-hmm. labor, which sounds a little bit crazy, but they almost feel like they've tapped into another level of consciousness mm-hmm. during their labor experience. So dealing with all those little mundane questions, it can be very, very difficult. And for women who say, you know, I think I'm going to wing it, I tell them, Mm. labor is not the time to make those kind of decisions no no you're in the panic zone if you're making those decisions then oh yeah 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 and of course that adrenaline is going to interrupt your oxytocin which is going to interrupt your contractions and Mm. uh, interestingly that's a lot of where we see the failure to progress so one of the statistics we see on doulas there's a lot of research coming out about it now is that labors are typically much quicker when a doula is around which is very interesting mm, to me. That is. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but that certainly is one, because if your oxytocin is running, if you're in that comfortable state, if you're well-supported, that actually correlates to a quicker and less painful labor, which I just think is amazing. <laughs> oh, which I would say is 100% in my case. I, I did mm-hmm. have very quick ones, and I do really... You know, one of the things that I also... I think, like I said, when I first met my doula... One of the, I mean, I just broke down, like I said, and I just cried and it was, and I'm not one to just cry in front of people. Like if you know me, you know, so it's like, this was a big moment and we were in a public restaurant and I just, all of a sudden within two minutes of meeting this woman felt safe enough that I had to tell her my deepest, darkest fear, which was birthing this watermelon sized thing out of my body. And I truly could not actually accept that that was going to happen. And I still had a lot of fear about that. And I think even just talking about it with her. Um, opening up, uh, with her about that fear, you know, I don't, I can't honestly say that I've had that many conversations that have been open regarding things I'm fearful of in life. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. when do you do amazing. that? Yeah. Amazing. And we start, that's where we start. We start mm. with that fear. We start with how you're feeling, um, uh, what you're thinking about letting that all out. So all of my birth practice start with what we call a meet and greet where we sit down and you just tell me where you're at Mm. and then we take it into setting up prenatal visits yeah you know sketching out our on-call time you know um we start with just a sit down usually over coffee Mm. tell me how you're doing uh and we start from where you're feeling. Mm, Yeah. And I think that's such a good place to start where, like you said, sometimes women are not even asked that question. And even when their children are two, five, 10, 20 years old, they haven't asked. Mm -hmm. Someone else hasn't asked them or they haven't asked themselves. How do I feel? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's always amazes me when I get that, that kind of blank look. And, And again, we said this, but it doesn't always change your decisions, Right. But walking into a situation from a place of empowerment Mm -hmm. rather than fear does make all the difference physiologically, Mm -hmm. mentally, emotionally, and then into motherhood. So true. One of the things I wanted to run by you, Krista, and this is something I talked about in the book as well, and I I refer to it and I give a little brief explanation, Um, but I'm wondering if this ever came up for you or any of your clients so far. One of the things I decided to do was, uh, and I don't even know how this came across my plate, but it was a couple weeks before I gave birth and I was in my last two weeks and I still had a little fear around the pain associated with birth. Sure. And I think for, like you said, that's normal. Like I didn't see my mom give birth and I didn't see yeah. those things. Like I don't have that background and I really just don't think I ever saw anyone give birth and nor did I want to watch anybody give birth. Like that was not part for of my... Sure. Hey, let's watch a movie about it. Pretty much every woman in North America. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm not alone. I'm not alone. So I, (laughs) so I have that fear still something or someone recommended to me something called EFT or emotional freedom technique. Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. So so, yes, I'll tell you about it, but I, I I think this was one of the key pieces that helped me right near my birth to get over or not get over, I guess, but really just come to terms with face that yep. fear and move through it. And emotional freedom technique is it's sort of adapted from ancient Chinese medicine and wisdom around the meridian points. And so it's okay. a tapping. If it's also known as tapping in like sort of colloquial terms. 
Okay. Yeah. So you're tapping on certain points on your head, your forehead, your above your upper lip, on your chin, your sort of collarbone area, your rib. And so you do this tapping and all while tapping, you're sort of not really chanting, but speaking an affirmation of sorts. So you sort of affirm that, yeah, even though I have these fears around giving birth and the pain, Mm -hmm. I completely and totally love and accept myself. And you kind of do this thing. Yeah. And I'm going to send you some info on it. Like I said, it's in the book and I'm going to get you into your hands, but it's really, you know, it's something that it, for me, it was an actual, again, practical tool that I got to face these fears. I got to say, I completely accept that this, like you said, is everybody in North America that's fearing Mm -hmm. about having a baby fly out of their vagina. Like it's a fearful (laughs) time. So with the emotional freedom technique, it actually allowed me to feel the freedom of letting go of these really intense fear emotions. Like you said, to put me in the parasympathetic mode. And so I think, I really think that, uh, that for me played a big part in, I really found the energy around the fear to be lessened after I did that. And once I was ready for birth, yeah, I was so much more open. I was ready to, however the birth comes, I'm ready for it. And I I was just not tied to that really intense fear that I had gone, you know, pumping through my blood really, I think just two weeks before. So anyway, I do write that about that in the book and I think it is a tool that I would recommend. And um, I think you, I I mean, now, especially as you're pregnant, um, you know, yeah, you're going to start to, one of the other things that I did when I was pregnant, you know, you're, you're early in your pregnancy too. I am, uh, I think I believe I was between 10 and 12 weeks pregnant when I went on a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat. Oh, I've heard about that. Oh yeah. It was something so great. And you know, it, I think it helped me sort of connect at a deeper level that like almost what you do with people, you integrate them by helping them understand that big things are happening, right? Like those people who didn't buy a car and they decided to focus on the labor and delivery process and all that, like, hello, talk about evolved people. Like that's something that I was just, I was in denial. Even when I was having a baby going, I can handle this. I don't really need to worry. But then the more I'd read, the more I would freak out because I didn't want to read the chapters around actually giving birth. Oh yeah. And so this is where, my Instagram. This is why I share so many photos yeah. on my Instagram. And actually, a lot of women who are not my clients, who are just friends or family or, you know, people from the community will say to me, oh, I have never seen that no. side of birth. So I share quite a few different... I appreciate um, that. Yeah. Um, quite a few different photos, whether it's, you know, actual baby emerging, there's blood involved, um, or whether it's, you know, those waves of labor that you're doing with your partners, feeling kisses in between, holding hands, whether it's those perfect first postpartum moments where you get that first hug with your baby so Mm. magical and I think it's so important I really believe so much in the fear that we have in our culture comes from people just not knowing I don't think people want to be afraid I think they just don't know um you know we have so the word doula actually comes from ancient Greece Mm. doulas are not a trend they were around in ancient Greece they've been around for years and supported birth has been around for years. North America is really one of the only places in the world where we go in alone. You always have non-medical support in pretty much um, every other part of the world. When I was studying childbirth, when I was, you know, getting into it more, uh, I did a lot of, of course, historical and cultural studies, and I, I still try to keep up with what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, but we have birth pictures, uh, you know, paintings and and carvings dating back to 906 BC. Wow. And two things we always notice is that they're one very serene. They don't paint women screaming and crying Mm. uh, out for help. They don't paint women that way. Uh, And secondly, they're always supported. There's Mm. no, there are zero historical images of women giving birth by themselves. Wow. There's always people around them encouraging them and supporting them and I just think there's something to learn from that that you know doula support is not a trend it should be a way of life yes um I've actually heard uh, a doula that I really love here in our community say you know we really should not need doulas 
I wish that every woman was trained in what her body could do. That understanding the sacred process we get to walk through was very natural and normal. I wish that um, support, non-judgmental open support was an everyday thing. Um, Unfortunately, that's quite lacking in our culture, though we are starting to see it change. And that's really uh, one of the reasons that I keep up with my Instagram so much because it it connects me with women all over the world um, Mm. that need that little bit of encouragement, that need to see a different side of birth, you know, not the proverbial movie where she's Mm. eating her salad, happily pregnant, and then 20 seconds later, she's screaming on the floor, pushing out a baby, which doesn't tell you anything about the normal progression of labor or what to expect <laughs> um you know especially tv likes to show us that three percent high risk scenario mm-hmm. right they don't like to show us what normal childbirth looks like and so that's really part of my mission is to bring some normalization back to childbirth to show people what i grew up with to show them those empowering moments um in all different types of birth in all different ways and just to share information openly i know i definitely learned from following people like uh you absolutely i learned to be confident in what my body can do i get information through that and so that's part of why i do that as well um just, uh, yeah. If you keep going, my goosebumps are going to be turned into tears, girl. <laughs> I know. Is that time of the month for me or what? But, like, this is oh. intensely awesome. Well, I'm six weeks pregnant, so I've cried every day. Yeah. Morning, you're, so. Okay. So <laughs> you're, worry, it's you, <laughs> then. It's you. It's not me. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm. Thank you. And I really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for doing what you do and for normalizing this. And, and then not only just bringing it up to that level of normal, but then like empowering in that way where women get to be excited by birth instead of fearing oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. I love that you said that. Taking it back to an excited place. Like again, I find it so funny when my clients are in that early labor mode and you know they call me and they're kind of like, so oh, this is not, not happening. And I get to say, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. And I've had women say, you know, I forgot to be excited. Yeah, <laughs> I was so worried and everything really? was right or correct. I forgot to just be excited that my body was doing what it was supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. It's it's amazing when we take something that culture has spent, you know, the last 50 years telling us is going to be the worst time of our life. And we take that back and say, no, 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 no. I'm going to turn this into power. To me, mm-hmm. this is, I don't know what other business you want to be in. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, kudos to you and amen to that sister because we're in it and we can't get out no matter what we do because it's in our oh, blood, yes. isn't it? Oh, oh yes. What a beautiful oh, yes. story to share with your family and your mom. Mom, and that sounds so cool. What a great, nothing better than really living it to, to bring out what's within you. Eh? Um, I thought it was really sweet. My, uh, one of my younger sisters has, uh, she doesn't really remember the younger ones being born. Of course, she's right. quite young. Uh, and she said to me quietly when she found that I was pregnant, would it be all right? If I attended your birth, and I said, "Come on, are you kidding me? Come on now, sister." <laughs> and I thought that was I was so honored that she wanted to see that and be a part of those special moments. So um, it's amazing to me, and it, it's so encouraging to me that uh, you know she feels like that's the space she would want to be in. That that's an exciting space, and you know she can't stop talking about how amazing that's going to be. You know, Aww. what other sixteen-year-old feels that way? Really? That's amazing. Yeah. Totally. And I always, I'm always encouraging too when people are getting ready for birthing. I'm like, have fun. And they're like, what? Like, it's that's the first yeah. time they heard of that. What? I'm like, no, it's actually, it can be really fun. And it's, it, for me, it was transformative. I felt like a different person once I birthed. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what my body is capable yeah. of. And, you know, I think uh, that to bring that back for women or bring that out for women if they've never had that is such a feeling of empowerment. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it really does fall into how the rest of your life plays out. It really does. It really does. Yeah, I, I look at the legacy that my mother has created by just believing in her body. Um, yes. I'm so thankful to be able to carry that on. Oh, beautiful. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Krista, for oh, being here. You. <laughs> you are a treat and I'm so excited to share you with the world. And I will link up all the ways that people can connect with you wonderful. and get everything that they need from your brilliant wisdom. So thank uh, you thank again. Thank you so much, Jen. Oh, it's such a privilege welcome. to be able to chat with you today. Oh, thank you. 
Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Krista. I mean, I learned so much during that episode. I was so inspired. I definitely, definitely already loved childbirth, but this makes it even more exciting. Thank you so much for all your wisdom. I truly hope that Fit Mama, you got so much out of that, especially around the mindset around fear, fear of the contractions, fear of birthing, fear of the whole entire experience. I would love, love, love to shift the culture around that. And Krista is doing just that with all of her work. Thank you for being here. Please forward this on to a fit mama friend of yours who is either pregnant or has had a baby or is thinking about having a baby. I so appreciate you. Subscribe, please, and share. I love you, fit mama. Have a great day. Namaste.